During an unexpected visit, Anthony suddenly announced, This is where my parents live, catching everyone by surprise. Behind him, his in-laws stood, their faces glowing with satisfaction as they nodded in agreement. At the time, I was in the middle of an important online meeting. Flustered, I quickly muted my mic, apologized to my colleagues, and ended the call with a hint of frustration. As I turned toward the door, I couldn't help but question their timing. What's the reason for this sudden visit? I asked, keeping my tone steady, though curiosity and suspicion brewed underneath. We're here to help pay off the house, my father-in-law declared with a proud grin. The absurdity of the statement almost made me laugh out loud. Neither of them had jobs, yet there they were, fully backed by Anthony's silent support. My heart sank at how readily he agreed to such a preposterous plan, and for a brief moment, the thought of divorce flickered through my mind. I'm leaving, I said flatly, shocking all three of them, with a $6,500 monthly mortgage hanging over us. I couldn't help but smirk as I grabbed my suitcase and packed for the business trip I had scheduled for the next day. With my bank book tucked under my arm, I was ready to go. Goodbye, I said, walking toward the door, already contemplating signing the house over to Anthony. The future felt like a breath of fresh air, full of possibilities. My name is Mary, a 45-year-old graphic designer who went independent four years ago. Since then, I've been fortunate to work on a wide range of projects, earning far more than I ever had before. Now, I live in a luxurious high-rise condo which I also use as my office. Two years ago, through Patricia, my former boss and Anthony's cousin, I met him. At the time, my business was booming, and I had just purchased the top floor of this building. Marriage wasn't on my agenda, but Patricia urged me to meet Anthony. He was kind, honest, and surprisingly youthful for his age. We clicked instantly, and within eight months, we were engaged. My parents had passed away, but my brother and his wife joined us for a family gathering with Anthony's parents and cousin Patricia. Everything seemed to go smoothly, but my sister-in-law's offhand comment, this feels a bit stiff, stuck with me. I hadn't given it much thought at the time, but now I realize she had sensed something I had missed. After we got married, Anthony moved into my condo, and we started our life together. His job was demanding requiring him to leave before dawn and return after midnight. He earned a fraction of what I did, and watching him burn out every day, I gently suggested, maybe it's time to find a job that's less exhausting. Anthony's reaction stunned me. Are you telling me to quit? Do you think I'm not good enough because I don't make as much as you? He snapped, his anger unexpected and sharp. It was our first real argument and it caught me off guard. I had never seen him this upset, feeling guilty for unintentionally belittling his work. I apologized immediately. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel that way. I'm just worried about your health. He softened, apologizing in return, and the argument ended as quickly as it had begun. But from that moment on, talking about his job became a minefield. He started working even later, sometimes spending several nights at the office. While I remained concerned about his well-being, he seemed to thrive on his work, so I focused on making our home as comfortable as possible for him to come back to. One evening, as we sat in the hospital room with his parents, Anthony broached a familiar topic. Could we maybe increase the amount we're sending for my dad's medical bills? He asked gently. Glancing toward his parents, his voice laced with concern, I felt a pang of frustration but agreed without hesitation. After all, I had no living parents, and our household largely depended on my income. Anthony contributed a portion of his salary to support his parents, though the exact amount he kept for himself was never clear. What was clear, however, was that he provided generously for his parents despite his modest earnings. Even so, when he asked to increase the financial support, I hesitated, 
This additional help would once again come from my earnings, saying no in front of his parents. However, felt impossible. Anthony, you're so thoughtful. Thank you. It's a big help, his parents said, beaming gratefully at both of us. Under their warm gaze, I reluctantly agreed to send more. After that, the requests came more frequently, often for things beyond medical needs. Although I wanted to refuse, it became increasingly difficult, knowing I might object. They began appealing to Anthony, who could never say no to his mother. Each time she asked, he would agree to send more money without hesitation. The day his father was discharged from the hospital, we saw them off in a taxi, thinking we'd have some peace again, but when we returned home, we were shocked to find his parents waiting outside. It's tough for dad to manage the stairs at home, so we thought it would be best if we stayed here until his back fully recovers, Anthony explained, catching me completely off guard. You can't just make that decision without talking to me first. I protested, surprised and annoyed. My mother-in-law's smile faded, while my father-in-law stood resolutely at the door, clearly expecting to be let in. It's okay, right? Anthony asked, briefly glancing at me before looking away, as though this had already been decided without my input. Feeling cornered, I reluctantly agreed. Fine, you can stay until he's better, I said, ushering them inside. As they settled on the living room sofa, my father-in-law commented, This place is really nice. Our house is over 40 years old and falling apart. My mother-in-law chimed in, Yes, it's showing its age. Anthony nodded in agreement, and I could tell they were hoping for a longer stay, while having them here might ease the financial burden. The thought of living together indefinitely didn't sit well with me. Renovating old homes is quite popular these days. Maybe that's something to consider, I suggested, hoping to subtly steer them toward a different solution. Yeah, maybe, Anthony replied dismissively. Three years into our marriage, what should have been our honeymoon phase was anything but. We hadn't even taken a proper honeymoon, the condo which doubled as my office, worked fine when Anthony was away at work, but with his parents now in the house, the situation became more challenging. If living together was inevitable, I would rather move into their home and keep this space as my workspace. Fortunately, my initial resistance kept the conversation about permanent cohabitation at bay, but months after my father-in-law's recovery, my mother-in-law still showed no intention of returning home. Their belongings began creeping out of the guest room and into the living room, as if they had silently declared this their new home. Anthony's reaction was immediate and intense. How could you say that? Sending my dad back with his bad back would be cruel. What if something happens? His raised voice felt like a hammer, meant to force my compliance. This was becoming a pattern, he would grow louder, convinced that would win the argument. His mother would usually take his side, and I often found myself alone in these battles. This dynamic had been going on for three years now, during which time I quietly shouldered all the household responsibilities. Despite my father-in-law's apparent recovery, my in-laws showed no sign of returning to their own home. They frequently went out to enjoy themselves, but their extended stay continued. On one particularly hectic day, I said, I have a meeting at 2 p.m. M. So I'll be having lunch in my room today, okay? I set their lunch on the table and went to prepare for my meeting. Got it, but don't worry about the dishes. My mother-in-law responded dismissively, barely looking up from whatever she was doing. At 2 p.m. Sharp. My online meeting began, but just 12 minutes in, the door burst open. Anthony stood there, flanked by his parents. This is where my parents and I live, he declared, their heads nodding in agreement behind him, startled and irritated. I quickly apologized to my colleagues and ended the call. I told you I had a meeting at two o'clock, I said, trying to keep my frustration in check, calmly, 
I asked, why are you doing this right now? My father-in-law smirked, we'll pay the mortgage, so you can leave. Suppressing a laugh at the absurdity, I simply said, all right, I'll leave. My calm response took them by surprise, with a $6,500 monthly mortgage hanging over them. I felt a quiet satisfaction as I began to mentally prepare for the next steps. A business trip was already scheduled for the following day, giving me the perfect opportunity to step away. Armed with my suitcase and bank book, I headed for the door. Goodbye, I said, leaving behind a house that had become a battleground. My mind was already on transferring the house title to Anthony, feeling an unexpected rush of excitement about the changes ahead. I checked into a hotel, eager to start a fresh chapter. The first thing I did was contact a real estate agent to begin the process of transferring the house, including dealing with the hefty mortgage. Whether Anthony could manage the payments on his own was now his problem. If he couldn't, the options were either a lump sum payment or selling the property. Accepting this reality, I instructed the agent to also search for a new home for me, one that could double as my office. Since most of my work was remote, having a dedicated space for client meetings was essential. The agent found a perfect location just 30 minutes away from my old home. It was a secure, luxurious apartment, and after a brief visit, I quickly decided to buy it. It felt like a well-earned reward for all my hard work. In the meantime, I stayed in temporary housing while everything was finalized. Once the purchase was complete, I hired a moving company to handle the transition. On moving day, Anthony and my in-laws were there, making snide comments as I packed up. One of the movers, noticing the tension, quietly remarked, You have a tough family which left me feeling a mix of embarrassment and vindication. A week after I settled into my new place, I got an anxious call from Anthony. His questions about the mortgage transfer made it clear he was only now grasping the gravity of the situation. In the background, I could hear his father angrily shouting, demanding that I come back immediately. Anthony's confusion was evident as he said, but we're getting a divorce, right? It's not fair for me to handle the mortgage when you're not living here. I simply replied, Exactly. If you're the ones living there, the mortgage is yours to manage. I reminded Anthony of their clear demand for me to leave, replaying the recording from the day they barged into my web meeting, a recording I had kept for documentation. Anthony's face registered shock. He had forgotten about my habit of recording important meetings. Unfazed. I calmly explained the upcoming mortgage repayments, which would now be subject to a credit check. Clearly oblivious to the details, he asked how much the monthly payment was, which made me chuckle. Despite previously showing him the documents and explaining the terms, he seemed clueless about the $6,500 monthly mortgage. His silence said it all. That's when his mother stepped in, her voice dripping with disbelief. That can't be right. Anthony's salary should cover it, she insisted, unaware that her son had kept her in the dark about his actual earnings. Her confidence grew as she declared they would no longer be helping me financially. I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity of it all, which only irritated her further. I think you're mistaken, I said, keeping my tone steady. The mortgage is $6,500 a month. Her jaw dropped. What? But $6,500 is Anthony's entire salary. That's ridiculous. Her shock was evident, but she quickly recovered, scoffing. No way. Anthony sends us $5,500 each month. If he only earns $6,500, that would mean he's sending us almost everything. You must be lying. I decided to end the charade. Go check for yourself. Anthony's salary slips are on the shelf by the entrance to the living room. If you don't believe me, take a look. Skeptical but determined to prove me wrong, she stormed off to find the proof. I could hear Anthony weakly trying to intervene, but soon enough, the tone in her voice changed. From the other room, I heard her exclaim in disbelief. What? 
there's no $5,500 here. Anthony, what's going on? As it turned out, Anthony's salary was even lower than I had disclosed, and I could hear his parents bombarding him with questions. Just so you know, I said calmly, making sure they heard me, the house mortgage is $6,500 a month. Take care. Without waiting for a response, I ended the call. Anthony tried calling me several times afterward, but I ignored his attempts. Instead, I sent him a message, let's handle this through a lawyer from now on. With that, I cut off any further direct communication. From that point on, my lawyer handled all the contacts. Anthony's frantic calls soon faded, and after a few days, the situation went quiet, just as I'd hoped. I filed for compensation through my lawyer, and after a while, I received a response that left me laughing at its sheer absurdity. It seemed a team of questionable lawyers had crafted the statement on Anthony's behalf, and it read almost comically. The allegations made by Shell are false, and our client is the true victim. We demand compensation for emotional distress. All I could manage to say to my lawyer was, I'm sorry, as I chuckled at the ridiculousness of it all. As the divorce proceedings continued, it became clear that our relationship as a couple remained unresolved. I was eager to distance myself from a husband who could make such unreasonable demands. Through my lawyer, I firmly stated, my client wants to meet and discuss this in person, signaling my intention to address the situation formally and decisively. It seems Anthony doesn't know about this, my lawyer said, handing me a letter. It requested verification of Anthony's claims and proposed a meeting to discuss them. I agreed through my lawyer, choosing a location far from my home for safety. On the day of the scheduled meeting, however, Anthony didn't show up. Instead, only his lawyer arrived. The opposing counsel was a young, polite man who greeted me respectfully. He revealed that his actual client was Anthony's mother and admitted that Anthony had largely remained silent during their discussions, avoiding eye contact while his parents took the lead in accusing me. As we spoke, the lawyer handed me a document detailing the supposed wrongful actions I had committed. Both my lawyer and I quickly recognized that the document was designed to portray me negatively. I took my time clarifying each point, and the opposing lawyer listened intently, nodding as my lawyer presented concrete evidence to back up my explanations. I see that the content of your statements is completely different, Shell. You have solid evidence and a strong case, the lawyer acknowledged. I corrected a major error in their document, and the opposing lawyer looked visibly shocked at the clarity and thoroughness of my rebuttal. Once our meeting concluded, he departed with the same professionalism he had shown upon arrival. My lawyer and I then strategized further to counter the falsehoods propagated by Anthony and his parents, reaching out to other relevant parties to discuss potential compensation. About a month after our last meeting, Anthony and his parents arrived for another discussion, looking worn and anxious. His mother shot me a hostile glare, clearly displeased. You seem to be enjoying all this trouble. Who do you think is responsible for this situation? She spat. Is it that you don't like this place anymore? I replied, attempting to lighten the mood. You used to love coming here, didn't you? We were in a private dining room of an upscale restaurant that she once adored. However, her response was grim, likely made worse by the fact that their previous lawyer had abandoned their defense upon uncovering the truth. Anthony sat in silence until we were all seated. Then, unexpectedly, his emotions surfaced. Shell, I was wrong. Please help me. I can't keep going like this. I'll do anything you say. Please come back, he pleaded, shocking his parents. I offered him a kind smile, temporarily easing his distress, but I remained cautious about the sincerity behind his words. As I observed the unfolding drama, I subtly gestured to my lawyer, prompting him to hand a crucial document to Anthony. His complexion drained of color as he received it. 
Just before he could read it, his mother, furious, snatched the papers from him and glared at me. The document, marked with bold red ink, meticulously countered each of Anthony's claims. In a fit of rage, his mother splashed water onto my face, berating me for my so-called arrogance. To everyone's astonishment, I erupted in laughter, finding the absurdity of the moment unexpectedly amusing. My reaction caught everyone off guard, including my lawyer. True, I may not have been the perfect wife, I quipped lightly. I shared the burden of household chores, endured constant criticism over my infertility, and even had my earnings manipulated. While Anthony's parents continued their accusations, my lawyer produced a photograph that silenced the room. It showed Anthony entering a hotel with a young woman, my former boss and his cousin, Patricia. The shock was palpable, Anthony was left speechless. Patricia stepped forward, detailing the situation and revealing the extent of Anthony's infidelity. With the truth now exposed, I handed Anthony the divorce papers along with the compensation documents. Overwhelmed by the revelations, he began to cry, while his parents, equally shaken, were forced to confront the reality of their son's actions. Within a month, Patricia informed me that financial strain had compelled Anthony and his parents to move. His salary was no longer sufficient to sustain their previous lifestyle, and they were now seeking lower living expenses. Interestingly, the compensation for my troubles and the deceit I had endured came from Patricia's parents. In an unexpected twist, Patricia found love with Anthony's former lawyer, drawn to his clear-minded decisiveness. Embracing these surprising turns, I began blogging about my experiences, which opened new doors for writing opportunities. Since the divorce, I've been courted by a business executive I met through work. Our relationship blossomed into romance, and he recently proposed that we move in together. As I prepare for our date tomorrow, I reflect on the journey that has led me to this moment. Sitting in front of my computer once again, I feel certain about my decision and ready to embrace whatever comes next.